Hey there, welcome to the channel. This is Studio Visitor, the place where we talk about studio gear, philosophy and history. In this episode, I was a guest of Robert Eitner of Suburb Studio in Berlin. Robert has worked with some great names in hip hop, uh, like one of the members of Mob Deep and, and ma many others. Uh, yeah, yeah, he has an extensive amount of gear, <laughs> and we agreed you can't have enough gear. Some great stories to tell. My name is David Jones, I'm the studio officer. This is yet another day, another story to tell. Let's make it happen. Yay, Robert, Mr. Robert Eitner, welcome to the channel. Thanks for the hospitality, having us over a suburb studio. We're here, man. <laughs> when I was walking in the studio, this space is amazing. Thanks, man. Really. Thanks. Yeah. You told me you designed everything yourself. Uh, how do you get a, a hold of the knowledge? Um, no, I actually didn't design it myself. Uh, John Brand designed it. No, oh, really. I built it myself. That's a famous name. <laughs> yeah, John Brett is crazy. Uh, so he focused on planning studios from afar. So I told him what I've got. So I got this house here and I got this and that opportunity. And he said, well, that's no problem. We can make something out of that. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the result is amazing. The lightning. Yeah. I mean, everything is well thought of. Uh, diffuser in the back, but, but also diffusers over here. Bass trapping mm -hmm. and uh, I see ATC monitoring. Yes. Wow, my babies, my babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're a lot of fun. You just have to listen. What do you think? Uh, what, what do you I think of that? You calling them your babies? Uh, yeah, she was. Uh, I spent a lot of time with them, probably more than with her. So <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's a little jealous, maybe. But yeah, she she knows how much I love music, so she's absolutely behind me. So okay. it's all good. Yeah, super important for making yeah. music that I have someone behind your back you don't build the studio like this in uh let me put it different you don't wake up on one day and say why well, i'm gonna open the studio well it kind of was like that <laughs> no uh i have uh, i've been making music for more than 20 years now yeah i, I started as a rap artist and uh got into recording since i was a rap artist i went into studios and recorded there but at some point, I just decided, yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy me a sound card, I'm going to buy me a mic, I'm going to buy me some speakers, and that was it for quite a while. And then I, everything just got built up and I ended up with a little mess of gear in the rack. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's lovely and a bunch of gear. Yeah. For but, sure. Um, you were doing a rap artist, did you do records or...? Yes, I did... Uh, bars? Well, yeah, both. Actually, we went to a lot of freestyle sessions and a lot of had a lot of quite quite some gigs, not a lot, but quite some gigs. And uh, I did actually three studio albums and uh, EP and just a bunch of singles. <clears throat> but it's it's like... Was it in German or...? It was in German, for sure, yeah. So you uh, got inspired by the uh, Fantastischen Vier? <laughs> Probably. Well, not really, but I, I had a time where I listened to them. I, I just ne I never only listened to hip-hop. Uh, I've, I've been make, uh, listening to so much music. I started with Roxette when I was a kid, so I was up to date during the 90s. Uh, or at the end of the 80s, beginning from the 90s, and Roxette and... Boy, I never... There's so much music, man. Yeah. Uh, Pink Floyd, I love Pink Floyd really? for sure. Um, then came Rage Against the Machine, some German rock, came um, Toten Hosen. Toten you probably, yeah, you sure. probably know them. And dude, that's yeah, like Metallica. And then then came different parts where I listened to dubstep only. Yeah, I really like dubstep. I liked dubstep. It's not that I'm super into it, but sometimes. Yeah, sometimes for sure. Then uh, we had like this little phase of uh, electronic music, like uh, electro hip hop. That <laughs> 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 was super fun. And yeah, and this is just everything what I do now is based on what I had and uh, what I listened to. In but the past. about being an engineer, mm -hmm. how did that happen? Well, yeah, as I said, I started uh, buying my first equipment things and then I just, I don't know, I just 
lost it with the rapping and I started to record for people, record more for people, then kind of figuring out, okay, what do I have to do to make it sound good or better than we actually had yeah. at that time? <clears throat> Since the equipment wasn't that good in the beginning, uh, the quality was okay, but it developed um, uh, on and on. And yeah, it's just at some point I just realized, man, I'm, I think I'm good at this. So, and people give me good feedback on my work. So I say, okay, I might just, just give it a try. And I've just been going on since then. First in the box, only in the box. Uh, yeah, first in the box. Uh, I still work a lot, of, uh, a lot of time in the box. So I kind yeah, of I like uh, like to work hybrid. So me too. Uh, sometimes I use uh, my gear to to print stuff, like when I record a guitar or a bass guitar. I got a uh, amp in the vocal booth, or when I record percussion uh, and stuff like that. I just I just fuck around with it. <laughs> just Why not? Have, just have fun, you know. <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> um, the type of uh, music does it matter to you? No, no, no. I do everything. Uh, mostly I do hip hop since it's the roots, and and it doesn't matter if it's trap or old school vibe or drill. I'm not so much into drill, but I would do it if it's necessary. It's not far from drill. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's just a matter of taste, I think, yeah. right? And um, yeah, I, I, I love R&B and soul very much. And uh, I, uh, I just contact a lot of artists, especially in this kind of genre to to make, uh, to develop myself yeah. and to, to get a better hearing from uh, their perspective, you know? And uh, yeah, that's just, okay. I'm pretty open to everything. A little rock maybe. At the time when you started, uh, it's about 20 years ago, uh, until now, uh, what are the biggest changes for you in the game so far? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say actually. The biggest change was from go from rapping to recording and mixing. So that was the biggest step. But I think the longest, it took me a long time to really get to know what I'm doing actually. You know, what does a, a knob do, uh, what does an EQ really do when you do this and that and when you pull it up or pull it down or what does a compressor do? So this took me like the most time. And uh, after I understood this, yeah, it was just, the rest is just kind of, Theoretic, it, kind of, <laughs> kind of, kind of, <laughs> kind of theoretic. Put it like well, yeah, this. I mean, yeah, sixty <laughs> percent of this is theoretically. Uh, no, I wouldn't say bullshit, but um, mixing is part partly science, sure. partly. Sure. But uh, to me, for the biggest part, is like feeling, hearing, intuition. Mm. I mean, if we both would mix the same song. Totally different. totally different, but that's taste. Yeah. That's the taste, I think. But that's super interesting. I just had uh, attended like a mixing session at a different studio here in Berlin, and uh, where ten people had the same tracks from the same from one song, and every song sounded song so different. It was super interesting, it was super cool because this one guy came more from the rock side. The other guy was. Uh, I don't know what he does, like heavy metal stuff. Yeah. Uh, but the song was kind of like electronic, a little uh, Pink Floydish, but at the same time a little Michael Jackson. So it was super interesting because it had all kinds of different elements that kind of took got taken out from different genres, which is super cool. Just to... Do you do uh, a lot of these challenges Maybe because of this? <clears throat> I really like to attend these kind of things, uh, sessions especially, because, but mostly not because of the music, uh, but more for the people, meeting people. Yeah, me too, that's the reason why I started this channel. I yeah, it's just so cool, uh, it's super cool. Um, and I've, I've met a lot of super, super nice f uh, people and I have uh, a couple of them are still super, super very tight friends of mine that actually live in Berlin now. But when I first met them, they didn't uh, move here yet, so uh, it's, it's crazy. This is not your first studio you're working in. Uh, no. Um, what do you thought? Um, so my very first studio was the classic studio in a bedroom. 
Like everyone had this. Non so you got your couch here, you got your bed here, and there's the mic. <laughs> so and then we I started out with this super tiny vocal booth. <laughs> yeah. It was like one one par, one by one meter or so. I think you have one. Uh, yeah, I had one, yeah. But I, 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 I tore it down because I just took all my room. And I was like, okay, I don't need it. I just got this mic screen thing, like everyone uses. Reflection filter. Oh, reflection filter, right? And uh, yeah, and then just kept going. And then I got the first foam and egg, uh, egg shutters on the wall. <laughs> ah, because hey, they work, right? No. Uh, yeah, but um, it's, it was super, uh, uh, it just got bigger and bigger. And at some point, uh, yeah, I, I, will, I was like, before I built the studio, I had a okay room, but I wasn't happy at all with the, with the sound in the room. And I tried to work with um, like multimedia arc. Yeah, something like that, right? Room correction. You no, know, room correction, I think. So. Um, Try to work with room correction, but yeah, this it just messed up more stuff than it actually helped. If you, you got a non treated room, yeah. it mess, messes up more, more stuff because uh, it, to me, it's a final step. Uh, if you take your first point for reflections, first reflection points if you take them away that that's a good start mm. and even when you do only that and then the correction software it's a better approach yeah but i'm doing I'm, nothing and then the uh correction no, makes down. no sense so if i would start over from the very beginning i would completely start com totally different so i don't wouldn't buy a, the ex most expensive mic the most expensive preamp and the most expensive computer or whatever where well, computer is important but did you well i, I got me a uh, my first mic was a akg which was more cheap like three or four hundred euros i mean it's still a lot of money for some people i don't have it in my pocket <laughs> i mean neither at the moment <laughs> um and then my First really good mic was a TLM 49 by Neumann. Oh wow. Yeah, that was Love a big that. step ahead. Yeah. So, and then uh, together with that, I got me a Universal Audio uh, six, uh, LA610 with the opto compressor preamp, the black uh, one. Yeah, I know that one. That's a limited edition, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, there's a limited edition one and uh, it has different parts or components in it. And then, and then there's like the normal one. Yeah, going on. but yeah, but I had this one and I, I used this for for years and years and then I sold it because I wanted to get something different and I was very sad. By now I'm sad, but I got me a different one. <laughs> yeah, the learning curve you, you had uh, because you're coming uh, from the era YouTube wasn't that big. Mm. Can you describe uh, your learning curve? What did it take? How long? No, <laughs> what, what did it take for you? How bad did you want it? I, I started listening to music completely different. So I completely started a new way of listening to music. So you know this when you go into a club like, man, your snare sounds like shit, or your cake is wild, whatever. Or you go somewhere and you listen to music. I actually just analyze the music uh, instead of listening to it. You're listening to it, but in a different perspective. You know, it's kind of like you're uh, and then, uh, at an FOH uh, spot and checking out the frequencies or whatever still do that yeah sadly <laughs> but uh, at some you point at some point i just really if i want to relax i just put my couch a little closer to the speakers sit down put on a nice vinyl and and then i'm just relaxed have a beer or two oh, really yeah okay i really like doing that i, I, I don't hear one. that a lot because most of them i mean uh, when i'm driving my car i don't have my radio on anymore <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it's, it's really hard. It's just, just more for being calm in, in, in the traffic in Berlin. <laughs> the traffic in Berlin is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing shit. <laughs> it's super. No, it's uh, it's really bad in Berlin. But, yeah. It's a profession. It's a lie. Uh, not even about the profession, but it's also a lifestyle. True. I think Absolutely. Two track mastering, two track uh, recording. That's the specialty. Um, yeah, I do very much recording. Um, I do produ production as well, though. I really like going deeper. So I have like, I kind of make a uh, year wise, I develop myself. So I, I say, okay, one year I want to focus more on this, but still do all the other things I do. 
Uh, for now, but at the moment, I really do a lot of production and uh, still do a lot of mixing and mastering, as I said, and recording for other artists. If they say, yeah, we have a studio, but we're in Berlin, we just want to grab the vibe here and record stuff. I send them the vocals and okay. whatever, and but they are mostly and mastering for sure. Yeah. Is there a specific approach you, you act with? It always depends on, uh, okay, let's say the situation is the artist comes, uh, says, okay, I got this uh, track from YouTube. <laughs> no, just and so he brings in a beat and says, yeah, man, I want to record, uh, help me to get the best out of myself. And I just tell them, okay, no problem. Um, if you want me to shut up, tell me, please. Be honest with me. Let's just work on it. And if you want me to put myself into the song, it's okay, and for myself, this is what I, uh, I get most. Uh, so most people request me to help them and to tell them if something's wrong, so time, if the time is bad, or I don't know if some of the lyrics need to be changed, uh, even if it's singing or rapping, it doesn't matter at this point. Um, and I just try not to just press start and stop. I'm really trying to be part of their way when they're here, and when they leave, they go back to their own, own, own old route. Do you notice that, uh, uh, that the artists you have, to, uh, do, your your method of working, do they uh, do the the people are being affected by them? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Because, because it makes them makes them feel more comfortable. It's not all about being that, but uh, do they have a different approach the next time they come to you, or even when they're recording somewhere else? I hope so. I mean, if it's it's always good if they have like uh, an influence of me, yeah. And if it makes it better, I mean, I, I only cook with water as, uh, as everyone else, you know. But um, the thing is, uh, I I really think that if you have something in your head and say, okay, this is something I don't like, I just tell them, you know, you could work something here, take out this word, which is only one word, maybe. Taking out one word of a bar of rhymes. Yeah, it depends. It depends <laughs> if it's the rhyme. It's, if it's the rhyme itself, it's probably going to be bad. But no, no. sometimes we have to rewrite stuff. That's yeah, just no, what sure. it is, right? I mean, we want to have something in the end that the artist says, "I don't want to re-record it somewhere else." Uh, uh, I just tell them, "Okay, I would say you do it this way, or you do it your way." But, <laughs> but don't write my name on it. <laughs> 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 no, but mostly um, this works pretty good. Yeah, mm. you got a lot of different uh, microphones uh, or just one? No, I got plenty of microphones. I got um, a U67 issue from Lemon. I got a vintage U89. I got a, a Brauner Valve. Uh, no, no, uh, it's not a Valve. It's a, um, what is it? Yeah, I got a Brauner mic, whatever. And then I got an Essen microphone, which is super nice, even though it's super cheap, but it's, I love it. And like the classic SM57, uh, yeah, I showed you the drum room. Uh, I got tons of mics down there, uh, up there. And um, yeah, it's just, you know, I know you can buy all this uh, stuff where you get like, okay, yeah, you have 20 different microphones and this one microphone, but you know, I just say, okay, fuck it. Uh, I, I, I work for the money, work hard for the money. And then I just buy the real deal. Okay. Work hard for the money, buy the real deal. But is there going to be a point you said enough is enough? <laughs> There's never enough gear. <laughs> you cannot have enough microphones. <laughs> no, for real. So the thing with mics is, uh, what I've learned in the past is that uh, not the uh, most expensive mic is the best mic. That's for sure no. not right. And uh, it's always good to have at least, I think, two or three different microphones. Let's say you have like a SM7B uh, dynamic mic and uh, a small condenser with maybe two different tastes. That's it. That's probably yeah. all, all you need. When you have run a studio, because Every person has a different voice, you know, and if you have a mic that uh, builds up the low mids, you shouldn't use a, 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 a you wouldn't, don't want to have a person in front of the mic that has a very deep voice because it would sound probably like shit. I don't know. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, so it, I like to have different choices, but 
in the end, I mostly use the U6 system because it's super, <laughs> it's super yummy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've learned like every mic has its specific uses, like, sure. you, like you said, uh, but um, you don't need 20 mics. Well, yeah, I mean, if you got the money, probably you can, but I mean, we all have dream mics and whatever, but... I mean, the 67 was absolutely a dream mic for myself. I it, it really hurt to buy it, uh, but it was so worth it because the down thing is when you have a very good mic, a nice room, a nice preamp, a nice artist for sure, it's also important. Um, <clears throat> this combined is, just makes stuff so much easier and faster. So the downside of this, uh, uh, of it is that you just have to work less, less EQ, less compression, whatever. I mean, I work, I, I compress quite hard when I record vocals, but that's kind of my sound. Depends on the on the on the music itself and what the artist wants. So I can record clean as well. Sounds fantastic. But when I mix the songs, I already use quite some compression. Yeah, me too. But do you uh, record into compression or just? Uh record blank and do the compression. No, I, I, I work with EQ and compression. Sometimes only compression, um, but it depends on the on the song. So all I always try to do is take off the top of the peaks. So yeah, yeah. yeah. It, as I said, it really depends. Uh, and it also really depends on the artist. So if you have an artist that's hopping around in front of the mic, you don't want to use a compressor because <laughs> it sounds like shit. <laughs> uh, but uh, in the end, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's about technique. Yeah, it's it's a lot about technique. I mean, I know people. I, I mean, I can give them an SM57 and make it sound good. It's no problem. We're talking about recording stuff, but uh, there's also a different approach where you get sent some files mm. that with stuff that's already recorded. You get a different approach with that, or just yeah, absolutely. Because uh, you can. I mean, you can still have a big twist on the song when you do this. This the work this way. But I think um, when you get uh, files from an artist uh, who already has his own rough mix made, you really have to make sure that you take care of having yeah, kind of an influence from the rough mix into your mix, especially when it's to effects and kind of stuff like, like delays or I don't know, distortion effects on ad libs or whatever, or backing vocals or anything. And especially the big reverb thing in hip hop, you know, like yeah, you got this woof, and then whoosh, and skirt, skirt, and whoosh. <laughs> yeah, we all know that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's absolutely different. <clears throat> and so the song's already printed, and then I just put my sauce in it, and I just I don't know. I make the my my favorite thing is the kick and bass relation. I always have a little more kick, and people like that. That's why they probably come to myself or come to my studio. Slamming it with compression and EQ. No, it just depends. Sometimes a little sidechain is everything you need. Sometimes it's EQing the bass and the uh, the, the kick. And just, uh, I don't know, it's just completely different. But the approach itself is always the same. I always start with the, uh, with the, dr uh, with the drums, then comes the bass and then the vocals and then the rest. So I built the melodies around the rest. Uh, I do it differently. Yeah, yeah. Focus is the last thing I do. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, it just depends, you know. Uh, mo but most of the time I do it this way because, um, okay, if you have only a guitar and a bass guitar and uh, maybe, I don't know, a, a violin or something, you can't do that that way. Drums and bass are the foundation of any song, any genre. True. It doesn't, doesn't matter uh, unless it's because of there is no bass. Mm. Yeah. But still, then percussion is the most important thing. Mm. Yeah, right. You use a lot of plugins, hybrids. Uh... Uh, so uh, the longer I work, make me mu making music less I use. <laughs> and it's really like that. I mean, I can still think of sessions where I had like ten, I don't know, maybe ten or fifteen plugins on on just one source, and uh, I just try to, yeah, use as less as possible. Do you use uh, subtractive uh, correction uh, EQs in, in, in plugins or? I, I use the Logic Stuck plugin a lot. Really? Oh. Dude, I, that's a, that was one of the first plugins uh, I had. Um, 
uh, back then I used Fruity Loops when I tried to make beats and stuff. And yeah. you have like the standard EQ, the Fruity EQ, and I just use it a lot. I know it. I know how it sounds, and it does sound some way. Yeah. Um, especially when you start with the low cuts and stuff. Uh, but yeah, at some point I use <clears throat> the Messenberg EQ. It's super clean, yeah. super face linear. And, uh, and also the Brainworks uh, BXV2 EQ. I love just that. love that. That's the very first UAD plugin I actually got. Yeah. <laughs> also the... love uh, the Fat Filter uh, Pro Q3. No, oh, that's pretty nice. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's pretty nice. <laughs> really? I'm not a super big fan of Fat Filter, to be no, honest, but it. the EQ oh. itself is super clean. I mean, it's perfect. It's for I mean, some for a subtractive EQ correction thing. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, making the low end mono with uh, cut, cutting 200 hertz on the side image. Yeah, that's, and that's dope to, be, yeah, to do that. For yeah. these kind of purposes, True. I think it's one of the greatest plugins <clears> ever. Have you tried uh, Nectar? Yeah, but. Um, I talk with a lot of people uh, uh, about this thing, Nectar, Neutron. Mm. Uh, these plugins are based on artificial intelligence. And, okay, uh, we don't know that. <laughs> yeah, but th this is a big debate and I know that, but I don't think um, Nectar, Neutron are bad products. No, not at all. They, they aim to a different... Yeah, uh, for focal and <clears throat> mixing, but... Yeah. Um, they make you lazy. Yeah, I think so, but I, I totally don't. Uh, I mean, I sometimes use, I mean, I even use ozone in, in every mastering, but I, I just use the elements they, they bring you, but I don't use like the, the learning curve. And I just, I recently had a song, uh, uh, someone showing me the tonal balance again from Isotope, and I was like, I okay. Yeah, see, I was like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's cool, but you know, I mean, I don't want to sound like the top 10. That's not my sound. I mean, we always try to achieve the best sound possible, that's for sure. But that's not what I'm trying to say. But the thing is, I don't know, man. I don't want to sound like everyone else. That's probably the better way to say it. Yeah. I want to have my sound, you know, my stamp on it. And yeah, not you, want, you want the best sound, but through your vision. Exactly. That's the, that, that's the deal. And that's what we spoke about uh, earlier in the interview. Give them ten engineers uh, the same files, ten different songs. True. It's all about being uh, being a visionary. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's talk about your gear, uh, mm. but I need uh, a bit. Yeah, let's time. move closer. That's no problem. Okay, we're talking about your gear. Yeah, best part of best it. Best right? five, best part of the video. <laughs> this one. This one. Um, oh. This is actually one of my youngest pieces of gear. This is the Carewax replica. It's uh, a company based in France and they have like uh, this console, I don't know what the exact name of the console is, but this is like uh, two channels of it, like a stereo channel. And um, it's especially like a preamp and a distortion unit, kind of like, uh, think of it as a little, a little bit uh, like a Termoni culture vulture. Um, but it's actually totally different, but it has super nice distortion as well. So this is like, uh, I use this unit uh, as the very first um, part of my mastering chain. The Fusion? Yeah, the Fusion. I, I, don't, I don't think I need to say a lot about it because too many people already know it and have it. Um, I love it, man. It's on my list. Yeah, it's super, 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 super uh, important part of my workflow. Sure, first style as well. You can use it on any. Uh, you can any. use it on anything for sure. So this is like uh, one of the rare pieces that you can really use on everything, and it, and it makes it better. So we can we can turn it on, man. I mean, people are here for that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got two five hundred racks. Uh, actually, three. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so it's sorry. all good, man. It's all good. Maybe I have four in some years. Slay the needle. Slay the needle. Yeah. The, uh, the lunchbox. The lunchbox. So the very first lunchbox I have, I have two copy booster cards. This is kind of, yeah, um, I had this in my mastering chain, but at the moment I just don't use them at all. They're just uh, for high and low cut a little bit. And sometimes when I record guitars and they're just at a sweet spot with the gear I use, but the signal is just too loud. I just use them for okay. turning down the signal. 
but they uh, in Nashville, what they do a lot about uh, the, these cappies, and they also have preamp modules. Yes, the VP26, yeah, and oh, that, I love yeah. that one. I love API, it's yeah. crazy good stuff. Uh, the thing is what they do, they mix their master bus into the preamps. Oh, yeah, That's sure. how they get the sound. They, yeah, they both in sounds. Interesting, interesting. Uh, preamp and after that into the, the, the bus compressor, but yeah, already after. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, and then the next thing is I got the ultraviolet EQ from SSL. <clears throat> super nice, and you can just crank it up, and it Perfect sounds it's, it's super, very, super clean. Um, not what I have expected actually in the beginning. I actually have to, like two you of uh, violet DPS. Yeah, it's just uh, I actually just wanted to have it because uh, I wanted to have the attenuation, the attenuator in front of the compressor. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I really use a, uh, I use it for top end and a little low end, but most of the time. Uh, when I use this in my uh, mixing chain, uh, I have this uh, both of these units. Uh, so the Violet EQ and the bus compressor is uh, on my insert on the SSL Sigma that I have running. The G Comp? Yeah, the G Comp is yeah, classic. Don't need to say anything about it. Just get that uh, radio radio sound, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, Slam the shit out of anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, one of my favorite brands, yeah. it's called Tube Tech. It's made in, in, in Denmark, handmade. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you told me a story up front about it. You don't use it any much that more. <laughs> I use it a lot. Really? Oh, yeah. On every recording I do. Yeah. On every vocal, bass, um, every vocal, every bass, every guitar sound, every percussion sound. So I got it ready to rock. It's really super dope. I actually recently had a session with a friend of mine and we ran like a, a complete chain through, uh, we, we mastered or mixed or mastered a, a kick library, oh. <laughs> which was super interesting. It was, yeah, at first I was like, okay, that's going to be boring probably, but it was super cool because we just made a chain and this was the last piece of gear in the chain. And <laughs> dude. Got some balls now. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, so he came in with like, I think he had 300 samples and he left with uh, 900 because we did three different chains. <laughs> and he was like, man, we need less than that. But I was like, yeah, right, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, it's the tube tech is just amazing. It's super dope compressor and I really prefer it um, uh, for everything else I had. The band dog cell uh, EQ by uh, ba uh, Dangerous Music. Yeah. It's a phenomenal piece of gear as well. A friend come by, show me, and I was like, okay, now I need it. <laughs> Super crazy. So you can, if you, uh, you, you, you just, it you it. just said, no, not at all. You can't compare it to the plugin, I think. Uh, that's, uh, even though, even the, the tube tech, you can't compare no. it to the plugins at all. Uh, it's crazy the difference. Um, yeah, but this one is like, okay, you just, I start by with the settings. I don't know. It's like one dB at four uh, point K. Like boosted one dB, and uh, I have like half a dB or a dB at ninety eight kilohertz. It's a different curve than yeah, than like, uh, every average band band XL EQ has and. This dangerous music man that make really crazy stuff, stuff right? Uh, and it's it's crazy because uh, that's where I, that's my starting point for mixing. I don't do high cut. I do a low cut mostly at eighteen hertz, and yeah, the low shaft is uh, ninety eight hertz, not ninety eight kilohertz. <laughs> and yeah, if, the crazy thing is, you think okay, yeah, doesn't make anything, but bypass it, and you're like, whoa, crazy! Yeah. It really? loses, I don't know, uh, like um, let's say three D. It's a sauce. Yeah, it's definitely like this one. <laughs> <It's Yeah>. sauce. <laughs> also, one of my favorite brands, Manly. <clears throat> yeah. It's very, very immune. Yeah. It's, it's kind of nice. a necessity yeah, in, in a studio like this. Yeah, it's uh, actually, I don't use it a lot for compression itself. I just mostly take advantage of the tubes that are in there and the transformers because it's like a gain. A, a gain game changer <laughs> it's super uh, you can boost the signal super crazy with it uh it depends on taste as always but uh yeah it's just super nice mm. uh, yeah this one the big beast the big beast yeah Pass, Pass EQ. yeah the pass eq is one of my favorite pieces actually in the rack uh besides the back eq um yeah it's dude it's just 
what super, do you what do you use for mostly um taking out resonances in combination with um with a different with a plugin i use uh, uh, from uad the bx uh, brainwax eq so i kind of sweep there and i figure out okay this is there and I, I boost top end for sure and boost uh, a little bit of most of the time it's 54 hertz uh, because it has super big balls and super nice bottom end the the the, the, the high end the, the top end on this one and we we, we just it's like sparkling it's super crazy yeah and I, I mean i've used the plugin for years you know and uh, at some point i had a really good deal happening with this unit i was like okay man i got the money at the moment so shit i need to get it because the price <laughs> was too good to be true and i was like okay let's go the thing is it's a passive eq but it's uh the beauty of it is it's, it's not a copy of of a pool tech or no, whatever no, no. It's, it's just a thing on its own and it's like man it, it sounds like crazy just inserting it makes something it gives more room and space and shapes a little bit it's like a, a fine a, how do you call this stuff uh, a grinding paper grinding paper but it also uh adds just air Mix. Absolutely, yeah, that's true. Over there, yeah, this is uh, this unit here is a zoom. Uh, I can't even remember the complete name because it's modded. Um, this is the 90s uh, from the 1990s, somehow um, a reverb effect unit. And dude, this thing is super crazy. I found a guy on Instagram, or I, I just scrolled through the uh, reels and. And I found a guy, he was playing with this knob. And so this is actually not on there. The power switch is also not on there. And all these switches are not on there. So you actually just had the effects itself. But here you have like a, yeah, let's call it a sample rate changer. I would call rate it. Rate crusher. Yeah, sort of like that. So you, um, do you know a Metatron? Yeah. Yeah. So you have like this knob where you can pitch down and pitch up. Yeah. And this is exactly what this thing is. Oh, really? so it sounds so amazing. So a lot of times I have people in here tracking guitars. Or when I have vocals uh, in a session, I just run the vocals through the unit and uh, print it right while I'm playing with the effect itself. Amazing. It's, it sounds super dope. I mean, I have never heard a reverb like that. Uh, do you know uh, a little bit about the modification itself? Oh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, I've never really took advantage of all these knobs, but you have different kind of noises uh, entering when you uh, put in each switch okay. so you have like at, at some point it's just super no annoying <laughs> uh, then we got the second uh, 500 bucks <clears throat> yeah right so the first one uh, unit i have is a tree audio tree comp is it called it's a, like a mono vca compressor it kind of let's say ssl on steroids because everything that runs through this thing is just big and fat and if you want to destroy it and uh, sometimes i really like to destroy it but doesn't that get a problem in your mix when you mix in when someone is something is too big no it just depends uh sometimes when i i, I really like to work a lot with uh, parallel compression okay. so uh i just uh, i have the chance to use parallel compression on this unit itself but I just have it on wet all the time and I just smash the hell out of it and I just tuck it underneath. You see that? Next is the Tegla Audio Manufacture Vocal Leveler. Mostly I use that on uh, on acoustic or electric guitar. Just nice sound to it. Tegla makes great stuff. Yeah, and next one is the Mark EQ, the EQ4. Yeah, everyone knows, loves the air band from Mark. And I built uh, two of these EQs myself. Oh, really? Yeah, really. Okay, I never tried that. <laughs> it's just too much work. I no, just I like to open the box it. and <laughs> just plug it in. <laughs> no soldering and stuff. <laughs> it was fun for the, for the time. I, uh, I would never do that again. Um, yeah, so the next thing, uh, one of my favorite pieces is the SSL EQ, uh, the 611 EQ. Um, yeah, don't need to say much about it. Next to that. Next is the RMX-16, one of my favorite uh, reverb units. And uh, it's super tasty and fun. And yeah, I do the same thing as with the Zoom. I just uh, run stuff through it, play around a little bit. What, what kind of reverb do you like, the uh, algorithm you like the most? Of um, I think it, it's uh, the reverse. 
I like a lot and um, Nonlinear. Yeah. Non yeah, yeah, I just it's love the Phil Collins. Yeah, yeah, the Phil Collins style stuff. Yeah, it's super nice. It's super nice. Yeah. yeah, and then yeah, most of the stuff that's coming up now is like pre amps. So I got the Chandler Limited TG2. I just love that preamp. I think it beats the Neve. It's my opinion. Um, it's like I can, also uh, I can imagine that. But sometimes I go DI uh, with my synths. Yeah when I want to beef them up a little bit. The cool thing with this unit is you can really hear pretty fast what it actually does. So when you when you drive it harder, you just take it back a little bit. I don't know, let's match. Okay, we go back here, just turn up a little, the output a little bit. Mm -hmm. and then, yeah, and the next is the, the 6176 by Universal Audio. Classic unit. Yeah, we talked about it earlier. So I lost my, the one, the 610 with the opto compressor, but I got the one with the 76 compressor, which I never used. <laughs> Why not? I don't know, man. I just. I mean, I, I see guys like, uh, driving uh, uh, into uh, 10 dBs of compression uh, when, when recording, mm. and they're like, uh, they're loving the sound. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, for me, it was. Um, just more about the preamp itself? Yeah, for sure. The preamp um, and uh, I don't know, the 1176 is always parallel compression for me. So the cool thing about this unit is you can like uh, split it in two different units. Audio. So I mainly uh, use this unit for bass guitar tracking, actually. That's what I love it most for, because yeah. the 35 hertz low shelf is just, yeah, I just heard um, Andrew Sheffs talk about it, and I was like, okay, I try it, and I like to preempt for vocals, it's okay, but for bass guitar, it just rocks, and I really like this one over the original unit, to be honest. Yeah. But yeah, that's just me uh, talking. <laughs> Opto compressor. Yeah, the opto compressor. It's a deesser, you know, from a Pendulum Audio. Uh, it's yeah, I, I don't use it that often, but it's super cool for vocals, deessing, doing tracking. It's very uh, unnoticeable. Yeah, and uh, I got another uh, deesser by Empirical Labs, which is even better, I think, than the opto compressor, uh, opto deesser itself. But yeah, also both DSs I use for tracking vocals most of the time, and maybe some symbols or whatever that's take out too the harsh. Yeah, take out the harshness, right? Next to that, yeah, the Acme um, Opticom, dude. This thing is just crazy dirty sounding. Uh, next to that, we got a vintage uh, 550B in a very rare horizontal version never saw this one yeah no no yeah i i haven't seen it at all in other places and it's really hard for me to get another one because i wanted two of them to have them like in like this classic 2u uh, one yeah. u rack uh, that you have and just put them in there and have like the 550 mastering eq or 5500 eq yeah. but yeah i just use that a lot on guitar and uh, sometimes on vocals but most mainly on guitars because it's super dope for electric guitars if you want to have this really bitey sound um, yeah, next to that, we have uh, three channels of uh, SSL6 channels. <clears throat> three because one is for my talkback mic. <laughs> talkback mic? Yeah, it's just oh, wow. yeah, the artist has to hear my voice good. So it's very important <laughs> to tell them when they're flat or not. No, just, uh, yeah, last but not least, I got the original Amos Neve 1073 mic preamp and uh, also the 1073 EQ which is actually connected via a little connector cable inside. That's and cool so thing. you have like the EQ is in, uh, in between the big red knob and the trim knob. Yeah, that's it's super important. Uh, so I didn't have it in the beginning and I really missed that because every time I turned up the EQ, uh, EQ at some point, <laughs> I always overdo it a little bit and it sounded just shitty because it distorted and my converter's clipped. So now I can trim down the signal. And, uh, and I use that actually, especially with my uh, vintage uh, U89 by Neumann, uh, because these both they're on female vocals, man. Mwah. Awesome. Super dope. On top of your rack. <laughs> yeah, on top of my rap, uh, rack, I got the SSL uh, Minx chassis was loaded with two uh, EQs, and uh, I think it's 
uh, came up from the J9000 console. Yeah, 9000. 9000 console. Yeah. And since I use the plugin all the time, I wanted to have the real deal. And these EQs, man, everything you run through it sounds better. Even though you don't push anything or, or take it out or whatever. But it just, just set sound. everything to zero. Apple. So, yeah, it's, it's crazy, man. I mean, it's ridiculous. You got a. Uh... DC Electronica meter in. Yes, this was a game changer to me. I can imagine. Yeah. It's an adaptation of uh, six, uh, System 6000. Mm. That uh, that already I loved, but this, yeah, I can imagine this, this is a game changer for you. Yeah, absolutely. Especially for just uh, checking the loudness of a song. Auratons. Yeah, the Auratons. A small, shitty sounding speaker, which uh, actually... So yeah, I got pretty big speakers in the back. Uh, so when I want to come back to Earth and <laughs> want to yeah, know what okay. it's like, I, I really hate listening through headphones. I re the, the thing with headphones is uh, it makes your ears so quickly fatigue. It's not true. normal. Yeah, true. Yeah, and that's like, yeah. And in the back, we got the big ATCs. A uh, big dream came true when I got these and and was finally able to move them. This was like the last piece I of, of gear, okay, before the actual gear itself, but... Was there anything that disappointed you when you, when you first heard them in your studio? The ATCs, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was like, okay, man, where's the bass at? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they still got pretty damn good bass response for sure, you know, but um, I was like, I mean, I mean, look at this, what is that, 12, 12 inch or 17 inch movers? No, they won't be like 12 inch. Or 12? Yeah, whatever, yeah. But I mean, they're pretty damn big, but uh, Base wise, I was a little disappointed in the beginning, but after getting to know them and having them uh, soften the tweeters itself a little bit, they really develop a very, very nice low they end. They sound it's so delicate. Absolutely enough. So, uh, so much clarity and detail. Yes, and absolutely. The clarity and detail is like uh, super amazing. So the thing is, when I got this speaker, I got I had tons of speakers. I had the Neumanns, I had the Focals. And it's probably also because of the room itself and the environment. But I really was able to start, I, I really started hearing different and new and mixing different because you can hear quite small changes in EQs that you make and it's super crazy. Thank you for the hospitality and uh, the incredible stories about you and your gear and uh, being part of this uh, amazing space, really. Thanks, man. Thanks for being here. It was yeah. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. If there's anything left to say for you, any advice for us? Subscribe! <laughs> <laughs> subscribe! Hit that subscribe button. Thank you check so much. Out, check out this guy, man. Super cool, nice guy. Thank you. We're gonna leave it like that. We'll see you in the next episode. At least I, I'll do you. I'll say bye. Bye-bye. See you next time.